the Dynamic Duel Podcast, a weekly show where we review superhero films and debate the superiority between Marvel and DC by comparing their characters in stat-based battle simulations. I'm Johnny DC. And I'm his twin brother, Marvelous Joe. And in this episode, we are leading up to our Captain Marvel review. Right, yeah, the movie comes out in just a few weeks. So to commemorate that, we are going into a couple of dual episodes, this episode and our next one, in which we talk about characters that are related to Carol Danvers and her story. Because we've already done Captain Marvel in a duel against Supergirl. Yeah, that was in year one, our first year doing this podcast. Yeah, so in this episode, we're going to find out who would win in a fight between Elastigirl from the Doom Patrol, which you guys may have seen that TV show recently. We're pitting her against Ms. Marvel, who's a fairly new character in the Marvel Comics universe. She's, she's a shapeshifter. Yeah, she's she, pretty popular. Yeah, she's pretty popular now. I think she might be like the first female Muslim superhero character in comics, although I'm not 100% sure on that. But nevertheless, she's had a huge breakthrough within these past few years. Yeah. Definitely want to go over her character and, and tell you guys all about her and see who'd win. But before we get into that, we're going to do a breakdown of the news from the past week. Not a whole lot of news. I guess something happened yesterday at the Oscars. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It was Marvel's big night. I didn't really watch it, so I don't really yeah, care. Yeah, you did. I saw you watch it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get into that, as well as a new Cloak & Dagger Season 2 trailer. And yeah, not too much news, just yeah. those two items. Yep. Uh, and then we'll go ahead and get into our fight breakdown. And as always, if you want to skip ahead, our segment times are in our episode description. So feel free to find the different topics we talk about and move to that time code. We want to give a heads up to our patrons that on March 1st, later on this week, we will be releasing another blooper episode on Patreon. So uh, listeners who are not patrons of ours yet and you want to hear our hilarious outtakes that we have on this show where Jonathan says something wrong and we all start laughing. Oh, gosh. Or I say something <laughs> wrong and we start laughing. Or Jonathan says, you know, a too risque comment about the female form and we oh all my start gosh. laughing. Or I say something <laughs> a little bit too crude in terms of like bodily functions. You know how it goes. It's hilarious. You guys definitely got to check him out. If you're not patrons of ours, go ahead and visit patreon.com slash dynamic duel and you'll get access to all of our bonus content, not just the blooper episodes that we've done, but also the other bonus content, such as like the top 10 lists and uh, the movie pitches that we have going on there. It's a lot of fun to listen to. And we also have a video of ourselves too. We did a question and answer thing too that you can check out there as well. Yeah, it was a call-in segment, but it's all available for $2 a month, which, which is pennies. Literally pennies. Literally 200 pennies a month. That's all we (laughs) ask for that bonus content. But yeah, again, the site to go to to check us out there is patreon.com slash dynamic duel. And real quick before we continue, quick shout out to Tudic Pete, who gave us a review on iTunes. We got one more rating, one more review from Tudic Pete. Thank you very much. As you guys may know, we've been asking for ratings on the iTunes and Apple podcast platform because it's our goal to get to 200 ratings because at that point, we become eligible to become official critics on Rotten Tomatoes and have our reviews of these Marvel and DC movies count toward the official Rotten Tomatoes score. And that's always been a goal of ours. We dreamed when we were younger of being film critics. So getting up on that platform, again, would just be a dream come true. Right. I think we're getting to the point where... We're not getting as many ratings on the platform. I think maybe because we might be exhausting all of our iTunes listeners. And I think a majority of our listeners listen either on like Stitcher or CastBox or Podbean or something like that. So due to that, if you guys can't leave a rating on Apple Podcasts or iTunes, we would please ask that you at least share the podcast with your friends because they might have iTunes accounts and we might get more ratings that way. So that would be fantastic. That would be a huge favor. We would really appreciate it. Yeah. That way we could stop asking you guys. We could get to 200 already. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. If we're still doing this by the end of the year, I just want to apologize in advance. (laughs) Right. I think that's all we have to say there. So quick to the no prize. A no prize is an award Marvel used to give out up until the 90s to fans. Our version, the Dynamic Duel No Prize, is a digital award that we post on social media that Jonathan personally draws for those who we feel gave the best answer to our question of the week. Last week's question was, in your opinion, what has been the best animated Marvel or DC television show and why? And that was coming off the news of all the Marvel animated shows that are going to be debuting on Hulu uh, next right. year. And usually we get some answers uh, early on in the week when we first drop our episode, but most of our answers come in when you know I'll post the question of the week to our social media accounts. Yeah. Um, Jonathan forgot to do that this time. I forgot so to do that this time. We got a lot of late last minute answers Uh, and so a few may still be trickling in so if we don't get to you it's because we've already started recording and we just didn't see that so apologies in advance but you still get honorable mentions in our hearts yes exactly Uh, honorable mention goes to adam spees and tim brown who gave the answer of batman the animated series 
And to me, of course, this is sort of like the obvious winner. I thought I was going to choose this one for my winner because it is a fantastic show. It was one of the most influential cartoons ever. Oh, yeah, absolutely. In fact, uh, with Adam Spees, who is one of the hosts of the Blast From Our Past podcast, we did an entire episode dedicated to both Batman the Animated Series and the X-Men 90s cartoon. So if you want to hear all about how much love we have for that series and how much love Adam has for that series, definitely check out their episode that we were a guest on and we talked all about that. Yeah, that was fun. Shout out to George Cronitis, who gave the answer of the X-Men 90s cartoon for its faithfulness to the source material, the way they handled those complex characters and those iconic storylines. Totally agree. Again, we talk about that on the Blast Form Pass podcast. Definitely check that out. John Romero also gave the answer X-Men, but he says that he nominates it for the theme music alone. Yeah, which, that was a great song. Yeah. 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 Oh, I thought we were ending it. Oh, gosh. How far are we going? <laughs> uh, also, another shout out to Giovanni Facendola, uh, who gave the answer Justice League and Justice League Unlimited. Now, that was two answers, but, you know, we count them because they're pretty much the same show-ish. And he liked that because of the way they highlighted the small moments of uh, your fan favorite heroes and all the iconic voices that were in that show. Yeah, I loved seeing that show, you know, week to week. It's just a huge gallery and who's who of the dc universe yeah but the winners of this week's no prize go to ariana quadra who gave the answer of teen titans due to the show's fun and accessibility and the reason i'm giving it to her even though i've never watched an episode of teen titans in my life (laughs) is because jonathan did not post the question of the week to social media Uh, we had no answers and so i went up to my coworker. i was like quick what's your favorite marvel or dc television show and she said teen titans and then i told her you win So I'm a man of my word, so therefore she wins the no prize. Next time, Jonathan will post the the question of the week to social media earlier. (laughs) Or people could just listen to the podcast and answer. (laughs) Like, I don't know. They don't need a prompt on social media necessarily. Yeah, they do. All right. Uh, We're also giving the award to Harrison Fox, who gave the answer, The New Batman Superman Adventures, because it has a shared universe. And I thought initially when we first posted this question that the obvious answer would be, again, Batman the Animated Series. Uh But when he mentioned the new Batman Superman Adventures, I just remember like the opening credits to that show and how it was like this combined show of both Superman and Batman, like my two favorite superheroes. You know, this was before Justice League, but this led into Justice League. And it was just great to see these worlds collide. Had all the lightheartedness of the Superman cartoon with all the darkness of the Batman cartoon. Exactly. And it was kind of like our first introduction into, yeah, shared universe, just like Harrison Fox said. Exactly. So that was fantastic. That was a lot of fun as a kid, I remember. So yeah, congrats again to Ariana and Harrison Fox. You guys win the no prize this week. Uh, if you listeners want to win your own no prize, go ahead and stay tuned to later on this episode when we ask another question of the week and go ahead and submit your answer without Jonathan's prompt, <laughs> please. <laughs> or with the prompt, whatever. Sure. Either way, on to the news. All right, so last night, uh, considering we're recording this on a Monday, was Oscar night, and it was a huge night for Marvel. So huge. One of the best nights of my life, I'm being honest. I was really not even super interested in these Oscars, but the fact that Black Panther walked away with three Academy Awards is just a testament to how damn good that movie was and how far superhero movies have come from being regarded as, you know, juvenile entertainment. They have deep stories here and quality production, and I think that yesterday the Academy Awards proved that. Yeah, in a way, but I was thinking about it, like, the very first superhero movie that really came out, like, to a mainstream public was, of course, Superman the movie with Christopher Reeve and the Richard Donner film. Yeah. And, of course, that won an Oscar. So, like, the very first superhero film won an Oscar. That's right. That just blew my mind. Yeah, that was in 1979. It won for Best Visual Effects, if yes. I remember correctly. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Both DC and Marvel have won quite a few awards, but with the events of last night, Marvel is ahead, which is fantastic. Are they? Yeah, they are. I don't believe you. Okay, well, let's break it down. How many Oscars have DC Films won? Okay, so we have Best Visual Effects for Superman. Yeah. Production Design for Batman. That was Art Direction. They won Best Art Direction in 1990. That's right. I know The Dark Knight won two awards. One for Heath Ledger. Yeah, Best Supporting Actor. The other one it won was Best Sound Editing. That was in 2009. And we have Suicide Squad. Yeah, which won for Best Makeup and Hairstyling. That was in 2017. So that's how many? Five. Yeah, that's five awards. But of course, you know, Aquaman got snubbed for Best Picture. (laughs) <laughs> or, or at least best visual effects or set design no but really the dark knight should have won for best picture no yeah but it didn't so marvel in fact has six oscars oh my gosh let's count them down spider-man 2 won for best visual effects in 2005 
That's one. Uh-huh. Big Hero 6 won for Best Animated Feature in what? 2015. I didn't know that. Yep. Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse won yesterday for Best Animated Feature as well. Uh-huh. And Black Panther won three. Best Costume Design, Best Production Design, and Best Original Score. That's six total. You know, we were just talking about cartoons and animated DC and Marvel fair. Uh-huh. You know, it's always touted that DC has the better animated projects. Right. And yet... Marvel has two Oscars. Marvel has two Oscars right. for their animated stuff. Yep. That's crazy. Yeah, Spider-Verse was just a fantastic movie. Uh, if you guys haven't listened to our review on that, be sure to check that out because I absolutely loved that. But yeah, this is fantastic news for Marvel. Uh, congrats to Ruth E. Carter, who won for Best Costume Design. I was watching like a featurette with her that she did on Vanity Fair, where she was explaining the waterfall scene and how she drew influences from all the various regions around Africa for the different tribes, like the border tribe with their blankets, the merchant tribe with their like turbans, yeah. the mining tribe with their headdress, the river tribe with the, you know, like the lip disc things like that. It was absolutely fascinating. She absolutely deserved that Oscar because she put so much detail and thought into every single costume. It was amazing. Um, Congrats also to Hannah Beachler and J.R. Hart, who got the award for Best Production Design. They absolutely went all out, like combining this real tribal influence with this real futuristic influence. They did an amazing job. And I guess Hannah Beachler is actually the first African-American female to win that award, which is fantastic for a movie like Black Panther. And then, of course, Ludwig Goranson won for Best Original Score, which I would have been so pissed off if he did not win because the score for Black Panther was just amazing. Um, It did not win for sound mixing, sound editing, and obviously it didn't win Best Picture, but uh, them the breaks, you know, at least to put us one over DC so that Jonathan can stop saying, well, we won more Oscars than you guys have. And I can say uh, that not only is Marvel better received critically, it is also better received by the industry itself. So in your face. I'm not going to lie. Um, I'm actually really depressed by this news. Yesterday, I was a wreck. <laughs> uh, um, I didn't think it was going to win any Oscars. <laughs> and I'm actually surprised it won in some categories like score. Because yeah. I don't particularly care for the score. Honestly. What? Yeah. I thought there were other films that were nominated that had a better score. You didn't see any of those films. No, I didn't. But, <laughs> I th- I, you know. <laughs> I just didn't think that Black Panther was that great of a movie. Well, you're wrong, because we gave it four and a half stars, which is nearly a perfect score. So in your face. Ugh. We're all the Wonder Woman Oscars, man. We're, we're all the Aquaman Oscars. Neither of those movies were good enough. <sighs> Fuck my life. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, though. Next year, Joker is going to take home some Oscars. I can no, feel it. Not. I can feel it. No, it's it's not. Oscar bait. No, because it's Oscar bait. Endgame is going to win all the Oscars next no, year. No, it's not. If Infinity War didn't win any Oscars this year, Endgame's not going to win any next year. Well, then Captain Marvel's going to win all the Oscars next year. No. Yeah, probably No. Will. Yeah. So yeah, I guess we established uh, that Marvel's better. So uh, moving on from that news, we have the question of the week. Our comics are better. Our movies are still better. Shut up. I hate this so much. (laughs) In a strictly Marvel and DC awards show, which film in their cinematic histories would you give the award for best picture? Yeah. So out of all the Marvel and DC movies that have come out, live action or animated, whatever, as long as it's theatrical, which one would you give best picture and why? Right. Because none of them have won best picture. Right. So in your opinion, which one should have earned it? Right. Go ahead and post your answer to our Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, or email us at dynamicduelpodcast at gmail.com. We'll pick our favorite answer and draw that person a Dynamic Duel no prize that we'll post to social media. Another news this week, we got a new trailer for Cloak and Dagger, the television show that is on Freeform. Uh, if you guys haven't seen season one, absolutely check it out. I think we mentioned in our Runaways trailer that, you know, Cloak and Dagger is similar. It's, it's a similar demographic to the Runaway show, but I highly recommend Cloak and Dagger more, mainly because of its two lead actors in Aubrey Joseph and Olivia Holt. They have so much chemistry together and they're just phenomenal actors and the themes that the show touches upon are just fantastic. It's an amazing show. Hopefully season two turns out to be as good as season one. And judging from this trailer, it might just be. I do have to say that I know nothing about the show. Uh huh. And even I thought the trailer looked pretty cool. Yeah, the, it tr- starts off with the two characters. They're meeting up again. They're fully developed in their powers, although maybe not because towards the end of this trailer, we see 
dagger using her light energy in a way other than to create these hard light constructs. Yeah, she does like a Hadouken. Yeah, kind of, which I think I mentioned on the show before that I do have a problem with the hard light constructs that she creates because in the comics, they're they're not hard light, they're energy. And they infuse people with like the pure light energy that hurts those who do evil. And you can learn more about Cloak and Dagger in our duel episode where we pit them against the Wonder Twins. That was a fantastic duel. I actually love that episode. Yeah, that was a really good episode. And here, Cloak, he's not using too much of his like enshrouding powers. If so far, he's just done a lot of teleporting. He's almost like Nightcrawler, the way they're portraying it and stuff. So I do still have some issues with the power portrayal overall, but the show is just so damn good that it's almost easy to forgive. Um, and I am interested in seeing how the characters evolve in the comics to perhaps match their portrayal here in the show. It looks like the primary plot thread of this season involves sex trafficking within the New Orleans area. And it looks like Bridget comes back from the dead, just like she did in the comics, and becomes an anti-hero, kind of like a Punisher. And she helps fight against the sex trafficking, even though she does it in a way that's too extreme for Cloak and Dagger. It does appear that Bridget Mayhem herself, she is the primary antagonist of this season. So it looks like they, they end up fighting each other, just like they did in the comics as well. Was she a minor character in the first season? Yeah, she was a police detective transferred over from New York. And she's working the, the same mysteries that Cloak and Dagger are working from season one and eventually gets killed. And she has her claw powers here. I'm not sure if she has her like her gas emitting powers that like paralyze people in this series. I don't know if they'll go that far with it or if she's just like super strong and has her claws. Yeah, that was weird. It's like in the show because the show seems pretty grounded. Does she just have like really long filed fingernails? <laughs> No, she has, well, I mean, she has claws in the comics. I was looking at her fingernails within the course of this trailer, and I couldn't really tell what was going on. They were long. They were semi-pointy. I mean, you see her slit a dude's throat with them, so you got to assume that they're they're strong as well. She's kind of going full saber tooth here a little bit. <laughs> but yeah, that's pretty much all I have to say about the trailer itself. Really excited to see season two. It's actually coming out earlier than I thought it was going to be because it's coming out on April 4th. So they put that next season in real quick, mainly due to all the positive critical uh, reception that I got for that first season. So again, yeah, if you guys haven't seen season one of Cloak and Dagger, definitely check it out. Uh, it's probably on Hulu. And if you guys have seen season one, then you don't need me to tell you to see season two because you're probably already going to. I'll be too busy watching Doom Patrol. Your loss either way, both ways. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, that does it for all the news this week. Again, slow news week. But let's go ahead and get into our duel match where we find out who's going to win between Elastigirl from Doom Patrol and Ms. Marvel from The Avengers. Okay, so Elastigirl versus Ms. Marvel. In a way... This is sort of perfect timing for these two characters to be pit against each other. Right, yeah. Just coming off of the Doom Patrol TV show and leading up to Captain Marvel, as we mentioned earlier. But this is a good matchup also because of their power sets. They're very similar power-wise. Yeah, they're both shapeshifters. Yeah, exactly. They're both stretchy and malleable. And this is the first time that we're pitting two shapeshifters against each other. And I'm really interested in seeing exactly how it's going to go. Because it's going to be hard to figure out how they're going to hurt each right, other. It's going to be a challenge. For sure. For, kind of like Venom versus Clayface. A little bit, yeah. I guess those guys were shapeshifters too. Yeah. We'll get into the speculation of how we think this fight will go later on, but if you haven't listened to our duel episodes before, we like to approach the question of who would win from a mathematical and stat-based perspective. Right, exactly. Yeah, what we do is we utilize the Monte Carlo simulation that takes the stats from each character and runs a thousand simulations using those stats, from which we are able to derive a percentage of wins for each character. Right, and we gather stats based on the official Marvel power rankings, from which we extrapolate the DC stats, and we include a few more stats just to make a more robust simulation. Right, and those stats basically get placed along a normal distribution, which is a bell curve, and it's randomized during the course of the simulations. Which accounts for all the different variables that these two characters will encounter during their battle. Exactly. So uh, before we get into the stats and we start running the simulations, what we like to do is we like to go over each character's backstory and give a detailed account of what their powers are, just for those who may be unfamiliar with these characters. And then we speculate on how we think one of those 1,000 matches between the characters would go. So let's go ahead and get into the histories of the characters, and I think I'll go first with Ms. Marvel, Kamala Khan. Right. So when Kamala Khan first came out, I actually wasn't too interested, 
But it was when she started appearing in the Avengers books that I actually took notice, mainly because of her interesting power set. She often uses her shape-shifting abilities to manipulate the size of her fists and feet, and it's almost a comical look that you don't often see being given to female heroes, uh, most of whom get powers that don't interfere with you know, the feminine aesthetic. Uh, so I thought it was so novel to see this Muslim teenage girl hero with giant fists. It was just so unlike anything else out there. And character-wise, she's very much the same type of hero that Peter Parker was back in the 60s. She's a social outcast with a lot of real-world problems who tries to be the best hero that they can be while trying to juggle a normal life. But in this case, there's a whole other demographic that can relate to her, which I think is awesome. She's a really great character, and I can see why Kevin Feige, the producer on the Marvel films, has stated that he wants to get her into the cinematic universe eventually, although I'm not sure how you can do that without bringing in the Inhumans first. Um, And if you guys want to listen to a great Inhumans movie pitch that ignores that whole terrible TV show, go ahead, again, join our Patreon, and uh, I have my Inhumans movie pitch there. Yeah, that was a good one. It's pretty good. So Kamala Khan is the youngest of two children born to Yusuf and Muniba Khan, immigrants to Jersey City from Karachi, Pakistan. She grew up in New Jersey idolizing superheroes and keenly followed the career of Carol Danvers, aka Captain Marvel, whom you can learn more about in our Supergirl vs. Captain Marvel duel episode. Kamala was an avid geek who loved video games and writing fanfiction, though her nerdy interests often left her mocked and bullied in high school. One day she rebelled against her strict parents in an effort to fit in by sneaking out of her home to attend a classmate's party. After being teased out of that party, on her walk home, she was exposed to the Terrigen Mists that were released by Black Bolt on Earth during his fight with Thanos, and you can learn more about that in our Shazam vs. Black Bolt duel. The Mists activated Kamala's latent inhuman genes, and she underwent Terrigenesis, just like thousands did that day as the Mists spread across Earth. While transforming in her Terrigen cocoon, she had a vision of her hero, Captain Marvel, asking her what she wanted in life, to which Kamala responded that she wanted to be like her. Kamala emerged from the cocoon, transformed into a younger Carol Danvers in her previous costumed identity as Ms. Marvel. She had acquired the powers of a polymorph and could reshape her body at will. Shortly after her change, she noticed that one of her school bullies had fallen into the Hudson River. Still disguised as Carol Danvers, Kamala used her stretching abilities to pull her ashore and save her life. Amazed by her new powers, she ran home and was promptly grounded by her parents for sneaking out of the house. (laughs) After her punishment ended, she went to visit her friend Bruno, who worked at a local convenience store, which was being robbed. She tried to stop the robbers, but was shot in the process. She learned that as long as she wasn't using her polymorph powers in any other way, she could use them to heal quickly. She followed the thieves to their hideout to find that they and other kids were being manipulated by a villain called the Inventor. She decided to protect Jersey City from this threat and made herself a superhero costume, taking on the name Ms. Marvel, her idol's old codename. In her campaign against the Inventor, she ran into Wolverine, who deduced that she was a new Inhuman and alerted the Inhuman royal family. Queen Medusa sent the royal pet Lockjaw to accompany Kamala and assist in her adventures when necessary. When she was injured beyond the capability of her healing factor, Lockjaw brought her to New Adelan, where the royal family explained to her her inhuman heritage. After eventually defeating the inventor, she developed a crush on a boy named Cameron, who turned out to be part of a radical inhuman group who was planning a coup on the royal family to establish themselves as the rightful rulers of the inhuman population. She managed to stop the radical group with help from her friend Bruno, though she was heartbroken over her crush's evil turn. During the events of Secret Wars, when the multiverses of Marvel were colliding and bringing everything to an end, Captain Marvel paid Kamala a visit to check in on the hero who had taken her old namesake. Carol ended up helping the starstruck Kamala and rescuing her brother Amir who had been kidnapped, and Captain Marvel ended up giving Ms. Marvel her blessing as well as a tracking pendant. A tracking pendant? Is that like Nick Fury's pager? No, it's just a tracking device. Necklace thing. Oh. As the world came to an end, Kamala and her friend Bruno expressed their romantic feelings for each other. When the multiverse was restored by the Fantastic Four, Ms. Marvel resumed her superheroics, beating other heroes her age, such as Sam Alexander's Nova and Miles Morales' Spider-Man, both of whom had a crush on Kamala. Iron Man asked all three to join the newest lineup of Avengers, which they all accepted. The new team fought against threats such as Hydra, Mole Man, and Annihilus. Later, the Avengers were introduced to Ulysses Kane, the inhuman with precognition that started the second superhuman civil war. 
Kamala was recruited to Captain Marvel's side, who wanted to use Kane's powers to detain future lawbreakers. Though Kamala began questioning Captain Marvel's take on the morality of pre-justice and ended up switching to Iron Man's side, disillusioned with her mentor and former idol. So she kind of had the Spider-Man role from the first Civil War, where Iron Man recruited Spidey to his side, gave him the suit, and then he ended up switching the caps. Ah. Kamala later ended up leaving the Avengers and formed a new champions team alongside Nova and Spider-Man. Powers-wise, Ms. Marvel is a polymorph, meaning she can manipulate the size and shape of her body in any way she wants. Though it's a little different to say how Mr. Fantastic stretches. His is very bendy and liquidy, and although Ms. Marvel can contort out of shape, she primarily uses her powers to do what she calls embiggening, which is to increase the size of parts of her body. This often includes the size of her hands and feet in battle as they get proportionally stronger with their increased size, in the range of about 25 tons lifting strength. She has been training in the use of her shape-shifting powers to develop a more liquidy skills, such as contorting her torso on reflex to dodge an oncoming attack, or flattening herself out to squeeze under a door. In addition to growing her body, she can shrink herself to a tiny size similar to Ant-Man, and on rare occasions, she has also transformed herself into other people. How small can she get? Uh, about the size of an insect, is how small she's gotten before. Okay. Finally, if she's not using her polymorph powers in any other capacity, she can use them to heal herself within an accelerated healing factor. Her one weakness is electricity and EMPs, which weaken her elasticity. Oh, awesome. Yes. What? No, I'm just joking. <laughs> I was like, no, Last Girl doesn't have any electric powers. Oh, thank God. This is about to go south real quick. <laughs> But yeah, that does it for Ms. Marvel. Uh, again, fantastic character. If you guys haven't checked her out in the comics, definitely do that. She's also on quite a number of cartoons, such as like uh, Marvel Rising, Secret Warriors, and she was also on one of the Avengers cartoons as well. It's fun stuff. Yeah, she's probably like, alongside Miles Morales, like Marvel's most popular new character that they've come out with in a while. Oh yeah, definitely. I would totally agree with that. That and uh, probably Spider-Gwen. Spider-Gwen and Ms. Marvel and uh, Miles Morales, probably yeah, yeah. top three. Now, Elastigirl is not a new character. She was created in the early 60s. Okay. And yeah. she's a very tragic character, as all of the Doom Patrol members are. This is actually the first time we're getting into a Doom Patrol character, huh? Yeah, it is. Let me break down her history. So Rita Farr, Elastigirl, was the illegitimate daughter of famed Hollywood actor Frank Farr and actress Rachel Drake. Rita garnered her own fame early in life when she earned an Olympic gold medal in swimming. She parlayed that success into her own acting career, and after starring in B-movie chiller features, she became the glamorous, albeit egocentric, leading lady in several box office hits. While shooting a film on location upon an African island, she accidentally fell into a rushing river with waterfalls. She survived thanks to her swimming experience and emerged from the river near a field of volcanic vents that exposed her to mysterious vapors. After dragging herself through the strange terrain, she collapsed from exhaustion and was eventually found by a search party. She was ill for days, no doctor was able to diagnose her, and she eventually recovered, at which point her body grew to the size of a skyscraper, before shrinking to only a few inches tall and it became clear that she was unable to control her size. Hmm. Shocked at her condition, Rita had a nervous breakdown. She was unable to maintain her acting career as everyone, including herself, considered her a freak, and she went into a depression, becoming a recluse and shunning her once adoring public. She was eventually approached by the wheelchair-bound genius, Dr. Niles Calder, also known as The Chief who offered to help her gain control over her abilities at his secluded mansion, where he cared for other outcasts with extraordinary abilities. Sound familiar? Yeah, he ripped out the X-Men. Except that this came before the X-Men. Yeah, well, the X-Men did it better. Agree to disagree. <laughs> so Rita accepted the chief's offer, and over time she gained a greater control over her size, and even became able to limit her growth to one limb at a time, allowing her to stretch her limbs across long distances. Oh, this is almost exactly like Kamala Khan. Except Elastigirl came first. Yeah, whatever. She, Kamala Khan did it better. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> she took on the name Elastigirl and, with her fellow housemates in rehabilitation, Robot Man and Negative Man, she became one of the founding members of the Doom Patrol, a heroic team of superpowered outcasts led by the Chief. New honorary team members eventually joined the Doom Patrol, including Mento, a psychic billionaire whom Rita married, 
and the shape-shifting Beast Boy, whom Rita and Mento would later adopt. Huh. The team that always felt like a family now was, and Rita was happier than ever, though that all changed when the villains Madame Rouge and Captain Zal, members of the Brotherhood of Evil, threatened to destroy an entire fishing village. In the Doom Patrol's final mission, the original members sacrificed themselves to protect the village, dying in an explosion. Or so it seemed. At the last minute, the Chief was able to put up a small force field around himself, Robot Man, and Negative Man, but was unable to save Elastigirl, making her the only casualty of the explosion. Oh. The team fractured, but would eventually reform later without her, during which time, Robot Man discovered that the Chief had orchestrated the events that caused each of the team's accidents and led to their empowerment. Even Elastigirl's? Yes. Huh. He despised Rita's personality and wanted to make her a better person, and he took euphoric pleasure in bringing her high status down to that of a quote-unquote freak, and manipulating her into letting him take her under his care. The Chief and Robot Man died shortly after that revelation. The original team, including Rita, was rebooted with strange new powers in the mid-2000s. This was later explained to be a result of Superboy Prime breaking through a cosmic barrier into the DC Universe's reality, which you can learn more about in our Superboy vs. Rogue episode. This sent cosmic, reality-altering shockwaves throughout the fabric of the universe, and resulted in the original Doom Patrol's existence, without any memories of their previous lives, hmm. including the fact that Beast Boy was Rita's adopted son. The team helped the Teen Titans defend Metropolis from the Society of Supervillains before Superboy Prime shattered the barrier to the Phantom Zone, at which point all of the team's original memories came flooding back, and Rita remembered her son Beast Boy in a tear-jerking reunion. After the multiverse was reborn after the events of Infinite Crisis, the Doom Patrol was rebooted again, and Rita's existence was explained to be the result of the Chief regrowing her malleable body from a fragment of her skull that he collected from the small fishing village they saved. Hmm. The new Rita was essentially a clone of the original, without bones or organs. She was also more docile and suggestible than she had been in the past, much more dependent on the Chief, which led some of the Teen Titans to feel that the Chief had brainwashed her but it turned out that it was the doing of Mento, under the direction of the Chief. Upon this realization, Rita also discovered that Mento had manipulated her into loving and marrying him from the beginning, hmm. as he believed she would never love him without the use of his powers. When she told him to never mentally manipulate her again, he responded by trying to mentally manipulate her. <laughs> so she ended up beating him to near death and then ended their marriage. In the New 52, the Doom Patrol's continuity was reset again, as was everyone's, and while the team was on a mission to retrieve a power ring, the team once again learned that the Chief had caused all of the accidents that gave them superpowers. Rita's power allows her to manipulate her size. She can grow over 1,000 feet tall, a feat that increases her strength proportionately, so 100 plus tons. Okay. She can shrink down to about an inch, in one story, she actually shrunk down to a microscopic size, but that's been written out of continuity. Oh. She could also limit her growth to a single body part, allowing her to stretch her arms or legs to great lengths or expand the size of her fists. Because of her new regrown body, she has no bones or organs to break or damage and can even regrow missing body parts should they be removed. So she's entirely just clay now. Pretty oh, much. Pretty much, yeah. Okay. Although I wouldn't necessarily consider her a shapeshifter. No. Like, she can't turn into, like, other people or things. Okay. She's not that versatile. I mean, Kamala does have that power, but she does use it sparingly. She's only transformed into, like, I think two or three other people in her entire time. She, she, like, loses her elasticity. Like, the more she uses healing, the less elastic she becomes over time. That's weird. Yeah. But I'm amazed. I, like, I didn't know much about Elastigirl, but... It's incredible how similarly they use their stretching powers in a way that is different from like Plastic Man or Mr. Fantastic. Right. I would say it's more like size changing. Yeah. When you typically look at like images of Elastigirl, she's not stretching like in the Incredibles. Elastigirl, there's that character and she's like Mr. Fantastic, right? Right. The real Elastigirl, actually DC let Disney use that name for that movie. Really? Yeah, it was the same with Karate Kid in the 80s. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> except you'll notice on merchandise, 
Elastigirl from The Incredibles doesn't use the name Elastigirl. She goes by the name Mrs. Incredible because they're not allowed to sell any merchandise of that character using the name Elastigirl. Interesting. I've never noticed that. And actually, that character's name in The Incredibles movie is Helen Parr, sort of like Rita Farr. Gotcha. Man, the Incred- Incredibles is such a ripoff of so many great elements. I know. I comics. know. Comics. It kills me. That's probably why it's so good. Yeah. Yeah. They take the best parts. But anyway, now that we got the histories out of the way, what we're going to go ahead and do is speculate on how we think a match between these two characters would actually go down. We do a little improvising that has no bearing on the outcome of the simulations themselves, but it's fun to do, and it gives us a, a more tangible idea of how these characters would fight. We don't set any rules for this matchup, save for the fact that the characters start about uh, 50 yards apart from each other. The characters don't know anything about each other, save for the fact that each other are threats. And we don't take the environment into consideration during the speculation, primarily because the environment plays no bearing in the simulations that we run. Right, it's too big of a variable, and we don't record stats for it. Right, exactly. Yeah, some characters can always win in certain environments and have an advantage over others, and so we just don't consider it at all. So Elastigirl, Ms. Marvel, starting off 50 yards apart, who goes first? This is going to be a tough one. I'm going to say Elastigirl probably does her trademark move, which is just to grow to a colossal size. Maybe not that colossal. Let's start with about six stories. Okay, that's about as big as I've seen Ms. Marvel get in the comics. Really? About, yeah, six stories. I don't know her whole body could grow like that. Yeah, it can. Yeah, she's not just shunting mass around. She can actually grow like how Giant Man grows. So she grows to about the same size once she sees Elastigirl do that. And so they see each other <laughs> all massive. Godzilla versus King Kong. Yeah, too bad they don't have any environment to like mess around with. Right. But, so like they're standing there and actually by this point they can cover most of the distance with just a few steps. So I'm going to say Ms. Marvel charges towards her with like fists that are like disproportionately big to even her already giant frame. So she like swings one of her like giant fists and just like connects right with Elastigirl right in her face. Okay, Elastigirl is not like the best fighter by any means. Neither is Ms. Marvel, honestly. <laughs> This is going to be a weird fight. <laughs> it's just going to be like a just a slap fest. I know, exactly. Just giant hands slapping each other. Okay, so Elastigirl, you know, from that hit, she's probably going down. And of course, you know, the bigger you are, the harder you fall. So she lands with like an earthquake thud, uh-huh. right? And then as she's on the ground, she stretches her foot out to kick Kamala Khan like right in the kneecap. All right, but I mean, it doesn't break Kamala's kneecap because as soon as she made contact... Kamala's knee went bendy and it kind of just like twisted out of the way of the, of the kick attack. And that's when Kamala like takes the leg that went all bendy, she twists it around and makes her foot all huge. She embiggens her foot and with like a powerful thud, she stomps right onto Elastigirl while Elastigirl's on the ground. Okay, but as like she's lowering her leg to step on Elastigirl, that's when Elastigirl shrinks really quick so that her leg's out of the way. And now she's only like an inch tall and Kamala can't see her because she's so big. It doesn't matter if she's an inch tall, she still gets stomped because Kamala's foot is so damn big. Okay, Scratch I said that. She does the reverse. She gets even bigger. So (laughs) so now she's like 20 stories. And Kamala Khan is just like now standing on her leg. And so, Uh. (laughs) so, so that's when Elastigirl just like grabs her with her fist like she's some kind of like big doll and just starts choking her out. Well, you can't choke a polymorph because her neck is just going to go like flat, basically. And it's not going to do anything. So that's what Kamala does. So Elastigirl, like she gives up choking her because she realizes it's not doing anything now. But she still has her in her grip. I'm not entirely comfortable saying that Kamala will grow to 20 stories tall because I personally haven't seen that. But yeah, we'll say that. So she grows to match uh, Elastigirl's height. No, what? I don't see her getting much bigger than that, though. Like, if you all of a sudden grew to, like, Godzilla height, like, 100 stories tall, which, can Elastigirl do that? Yeah, she can. Okay, well, Kamala can't do that. So Kamala's going to grow to about 20 stories tall, about probably to her max is what I'll say. Uh-huh. And then Elastigirl's going to grow even larger. Right. Okay. So now Elastigirl's 100 stories tall, and, and Miss Marvel's only 20 stories tall. Uh-huh. So that's when Elastigirl picks Miss Marvel up and just, like, grabs her by the leg and, like, just slams her over repeatedly into the ground. Okay, I'm not going to say that's not going to hurt Ms. Marvel because she, again, is not entirely a liquid state polymorph like Mr. Fantastic where he could just, you know, but she can flatten. So if she gets hurt, she probably gets slammed like once or twice, but then after that, she's absolutely flattening herself out so that she can't be slammed down anymore. 
And with that, with her flat body, she wraps her arms and legs around Elastigirls and cinches them together so that now Elastigirl's falling, but she's falling from a height of 100 stories. That's really going to hurt. But, I mean, it's all relative. It's like if you or I, like, fell, you know, because she's also bigger and stronger when she's that size. Yeah. So it's not going to hurt as much. So, you know, she's on the ground. Her legs are tied. She's going to grab. But what you don't know is that she slams her head on the ground. No, she doesn't do that. Yeah. She slams her head on the ground real bad. She's falling at such a, like, uh, like such a slow rate. She's going to have enough reaction time to not land on her head. Okay, whatever. <laughs> So she's on the ground. She has Miss Marvel wrapped around her legs. That's when she just grabs like two fistfuls of Miss Marvel and just stretches her like taffy. Oh God. Then like brings it to her mouth and just bites her. No, <laughs> Jesus. All right, so that's so bizarre. Is that too bizarre? I that's don't know. Bizarre. I don't know. <laughs> Would Elastic Girl bite in a fight? I guess it's, it's like I, she, she, she can't hit her. She can't punch her. She can't do anything like okay. physical force to her. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. Okay, so right as Elastigirl is stretching out Ms. Marvel and is about to bite her, that's when Ms. Marvel shrinks down. She slips out of her grasp and shrinks down to, uh, you know, the size of a bug, basically. Yeah, so now Ms. Marvel is about the size of a bug. Inside and she gets of, eaten. Inside she of, gets eaten. Okay, yeah, so she gets swallowed. So she's going down inside into uh, Elastigirl's body. Okay, right. and at this point... That's when she expands. She starts in beginning. Okay. And she expands, like, right inside of Elastigirl's chest. And she, like, springs forth out of Elastigirl's chest like a fucking alien monster. And pretty much kills Elastigirl that way. Except Elastigirl doesn't have any organs. So then how the fuck does she swallow? What happens? What's inside her body when she and swallows? She just goes into her body into, you know, like, this... That's bizarre. <laughs> form. I don't know. I don't like it. So she could chest burst out, but it's not going to hurt Elastigirl. So Elastigirl, are you saying Elastigirl can't be physically hurt? Like Clayface? Kinda, yeah. I've seen Elastigirl with like her like torso like chopped up like sliced bread, and so then she just forms back together. That's violent. Yeah. Well, I mean, Kamala Khan, she's been shot before. She's obviously not that malleable. She can still be hurt a lot easier than Elastigirl, which is why she has her healing factor. So that's disconcerting. So she busts out of her chest. She thinks that's the killing blow. Finds out that, yeah, Elastigirl is pretty much made out of putty. So that doesn't hurt her at all. She also probably discovered while she was inside of her body that Elastigirl doesn't have any organs. And I don't know how she's even alive then. Like, what is her brain made out of? It's just consciousness given to rubber, I guess. It's weird. Yeah. Deal with it. <laughs> so at that point, Ms. Marvel's like, oh, shit, what do I do? Because obviously nothing that I do is going to hurt her. So at that point, she probably just like grows long stilt legs and probably just runs. <laughs> <laughs> and so Elastigirl's like chasing her, like freaking Godzilla chasing like stilt man. Yeah. And, <laughs> and now it's a game of tag. And now it's a game of tag. But of course, Elastigirl could just stretch her arm and grab Miss Marvel. But Miss Marvel could probably dodge the grab because I'm guessing that as a 100 story woman, she's probably slow as shit. Probably. Miss Marvel's not that slow. She can get across pretty quick with her long legs. And I have no idea where to go from here with this match. <laughs> Maybe we'll just end it with them chasing each other. <laughs> you know? Maybe. This is why I'm kind of dreading like a Mr. Fantastic versus Plastic Man match. Because although I think we could do a lot more with them, those guys absolutely cannot hurt each other. I don't know how they would hurt each other. Exactly. Mr. Fantastic would have to bring in some kind of invention or something like that. I don't know. Um, which is probably what he'll do whenever we get to that match. Well, you know, Rita Farr does have connections to, like, her own Mr. Fantastic in Niles Calder. This is a one-on-one -on -one match. Okay. Because, uh, yeah, you could say Kamala also has connections to Iron Man, who's on the Avengers team with her at one point. That's fair. So there you go. Let's go ahead and take this to the stats, and we'll go ahead and figure out who's going to win this thing that way. All right, and we're back. I think that's the first time a simulation of ours has ever ended in just someone running away. Because <laughs> that's not how matches usually end. Right. And it, it, it's hard with these polymorph characters, although I think that we did come to a pretty good end with the Venom versus Clayface fight. It's just a lot harder with this particular match because Kamala Khan doesn't have, like, sharp blades or anything like that. Like right, Venom if she had, like, it. freezing powers or, like, explosives or anything like that, this would be a different story. Yeah, or if Elastigirl had, like, electricity powers or something like that. Yeah. But when you throw, you know, a block of putty at another block of putty, <laughs> it's a little hard. But uh, So we ran a 1,000 simulations, and we have the winner. The stats 
were not quite as even as I thought they would be initially, even though their power sets are very similar. And I, I do think that this was uh, as good of a matchup as you're going to get with these characters. But there were differences in matters of strength because Elastigirl can get a lot bigger than right. Marvel. Yeah, exactly. And and her strength goes beyond, you know, the class 100 level. Whereas Ms. Marvel's strength usually peaks out at around 25 tons. So she's not quite as strong as Elastigirl. Um, the other big difference was in terms of durability. Being that, you know, Elastigirl doesn't have any real organs or anything like that. She really can't be hurt. And granted, you know, the version that I'm using of Elastigirl is one in which she was a clone. Yeah. So, like, in the New 52 so reboot... Cheated, basically. Sort of. She hasn't really been as involved in the DC Universe history as other characters. Because she's been dead for a long time. Uh-huh. So, when she came back since that time forward... You know, she has been this version of the character. Uh huh. And that's the version I am most familiar with. So gotcha. that's the version I went with. Yeah, and that was a total cheater move because Kamala can definitely be hurt. We've seen her get shot before. We've seen her get really hurt before. And that's why she has her healing factor is to get over wounds like that. Wounds that, you know, Last Girl wouldn't even think twice about. So that was a huge detriment. But otherwise, they were pretty much the same, you know, across the board in terms of speed, in terms of like their fighting ability. They're both not great fighters in terms of the potential damage that they can cause and also in terms of their intelligence. Pretty much even there. Yeah. And I want to say strategic intelligence because Rita's a lot older than Kamala Khan. Right. You know, but she may not necessarily have as much fighting experience, I don't think, because of how long she's been dead and how much she hasn't been fighting for much of her life. True. So um, after 1,000 simulations, the winner of the Elastigirl versus Ms. Marvel duel is Elastigirl. Obviously. I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> so Elastigirl won 678 matches out of 1,000, while Ms. Marvel won 322. So 67.8% versus 32.2%. Actually, I thought it was going to be more than that. No. Yeah. I mean, it's not close, but it's not horribly one-sided either. Now, how Ms. Marvel would manage to go about winning about a third of these matches, I have no idea. <laughs> but I would have to assume that, I don't know, maybe she would use some kind of environment uh, to her advantage or something like that, even though, obviously, we don't account for that in these fights. Or in the stats. Or in the stats or anything. But, that yeah, that's the only way I can imagine any of these guys hurting each other. They just bite each other. <laughs> it all comes down to biting. <laughs> no, it doesn't. <laughs> Gross. All right, uh, that does it for this episode, guys. Go ahead and let us know what you thought about this by reaching out to us on social media. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and Patreon. And you can find links to all of those platforms by visiting our site at dynamicduel.com. Which we've recently redesigned. Yeah, I mean, it's not a huge redesign, but it looks a little bit better than it did. So go ahead and check that out. You guys can also check out what we look like if you go to that site because we have like little about us bio sections the site is still a work in progress so we're going to be adding additional pages uh, as we go along but for now it's in a pretty good spot so go ahead and check that out because also on that site you can find a link to our merch store in which we sell t-shirts and coffee mugs and little notebooks and stickers and all the and things pillows. that you want uh, to buy definitely check that out they're all our designs that we use for the no prizes that jonathan draws I think this week, Jonathan is drawing Ms. Marvel for the no prize. Right. So if you want a Ms. Marvel uh, t-shirt, go ahead and visit dynamicduel.com. And if you don't like Ms. Marvel, you know, we still have Venom t-shirts and stuff that you could check out. Yeah, that would be great. And please don't forget to rate, review, share, and subscribe to our podcast, especially rating on iTunes. As we mentioned earlier, trying to get to 200, the sooner we get to that, the better. Yeah, and if you can't rate us or if you have already rated us on iTunes or Apple Podcasts, please share this show with a friend uh, that you think would enjoy it because, again, they might have the capability to rate us on those platforms. So that would be super appreciated. And I think that about does it for this episode. In our next episode, again, we as we mentioned, we'll be doing another dual episode. This time we're going to be pitting the Ray against Photon. Yeah, Photon is Monica Rambeau. Uh, she's gone by many code names, including Captain Marvel, including Pulsar, but we're going to go with Photon for this particular matchup. It's the same character as Monica Rambeau, who's actually going to be in the Captain Marvel movie, uh, a young version of her. And her mom, of course, is Maria Rambeau, who's going to be a, a fighter pilot alongside Carol Danvers. So after this upcoming duel of Ray versus Photon, we're actually going to be reviewing the Captain Marvel movie, because that's when the film comes out. And I can't wait for that. Yeah, that's so, coming up really soon. Yeah. So definitely check out both those episodes coming up. And uh, until next week, up, up, and away. True believers.